Good morning. I'm calling to order this hearing. This is a performance oversight hearing of the Committee on Health. I'm Council Member of that Alexander. I represent Ward 7, and I also chair this committee. Today is Tuesday, April 23rd, 2013. Uh, the time is, and please forgive me, the time is approximately 10 47 a.m. and we are in room 500 of the John A. Wilson building. The purpose of today's hearing is to discuss the proposed FY14 budget for the Health Benefit Exchange Authority. The DC Health Benefit Exchange Authority was established by the Health Benefit Exchange Authority Establishment Act of 2011. The mission of the DC Health Benefit Exchange Authority is to implement a health care exchange program in the District of Columbia in accordance with the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, thereby ensuring access to quality and affordable health care to all DC residents. The health care exchange program will enable individuals and small employers to find affordable and easier to understand health insurance and assist small employers in purchasing qualified health benefit plans for their employees. The exchange will facilitate the purchase of qualified health plans and assist individuals and groups to access programs, premium assistance tax credits, and cost sharing reductions. Uh, we have no public witnesses today, and I see our executive witnesses are here at the table. And we have Mila Kaufman, our executive director of the exchange, and Dr. Mohammed Akhtar, the president of the Health Benefit Exchange. Good morning and welcome, and thank you for your patience. And I do have your testimony, so good morning. You may proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair, um, members of the committee. My name is Mohammed Akhtar, and I have the distinct honor to be the chair of the Health Benefit Exchange Authority. Exchange is the place where people will come, write in, or get on the website to buy affordable health care. This is for the individuals who are uninsured, also for the small businesses who need health insurance. And um, I want to start this morning, Madam Chair, by thanking you and the members of the City Council and Mayor Gray for your leadership in establishing our own exchange. We are one of the 18 states who are developing their own exchanges. And this is a, a wonderful thing. Why do I say this is a wonderful thing? Because having our own exchange has given us the opportunity to build the exchange from ground up with the participation of all the stakeholders in our city. It has also given us the opportunity to build the exchange in a way that meets the needs of our people and also uh, gives us and maintains our values in, for, for that we so dearly hold. Exchange consists of the leadership of 11 members. Seven of the members are from the public. Four directors serve on the exchange. All of these 11 members serve without any compensation. They have spent an enormous amount of time working through this process. In addition to having numerous subcommittee meetings, committee meetings, work group meetings, in the past eight months, there have been 19 board meetings, eight months. We have worked very hard to make sure that we meet all the deadlines and we submit the, the, our recommendation to you. And I'm very pleased to inform you that we have submitted our recommendation in the form of the legislative package that will be coming to the council and to your committee for appropriate action to move forward. Now, if we couldn't be able to do this all of this without the support of our sister agencies. And I want to take a moment here because it's so hard to build something that's never been done before. There's no road map. There's no track record on which to, which to build. Everything has to be done from anew. And many of the city agencies have been extremely helpful to us. And I want to start by saying Sean Stokes, Department of Personnel, James Staten, Mr. Gandhi, Chief Financial Officer, were extremely helpful in putting things together. Our own sister agencies in the Health and Human Services area were very cooperative 
In fact, all the money that we have spent so far has been done through the healthcare finance department, for which we are, we are grateful. In addition to our agencies, we had also great support and guidance from the executive office of the mayor, particularly Alan Liu, the city administrator, been very helpful. B.B. Otero, the deputy mayor for health and human services, been very helpful. And Janine Jackson, the mayor's legislative director, been very, very helpful in, in, in moving us along. In healthcare reform, there are many good things. ACA offered many opportunities, many consumer protections. After we are said and done, it'd be the law of the land come January 1st, 2014, that every individual must have health insurance. And the timing has been the common, the most important and most difficult task where we have to establish these exchanges within 10 months after the funds were given to us. And these are very complicated structure to establish and we have worked as hard as we, we could to make this happen. And um, as you know, and we all know that we can't do these things without our staff. So I'm very grateful to have the leadership of Mila Kaufman, who's been our executive director and her team. They work 24 seven to make sure that we meet every deadline, everything that we need to do so that the exchange will open its door on October 1, 2013 and we will start the enrollment of our, our citizens. And this is a great accomplishment for where we are today. And we continue to work very hard to make sure that things get done. I turn this over to my colleague, Mila Kaufman, who is going to now present our formal testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Octor. It's so important to thank everyone. <laughs> so that's m very much appreciated. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning. Good morning. Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Mila Kaufman and as the Executive Director of the DC Health Benefit Exchange Authority, it is my pleasure to provide testimony on our proposed fiscal year 2014 budget. The District of Columbia is a national leader in protecting and improving the health of our residents. Approximately 93% of our residents have health coverage as a result of significant investments in our city's uh, health care delivery. And the coverage initiatives and the strategic policy decisions by you and other policymakers. We have the second highest insured rate in the country, something we all should be proud of. But our job is not yet done. More than 42,000 people here in the district do not have any health coverage, neither private nor public insurance, and thousands of people are underinsured. Their insurance does not provide access to needed medical care or leaves them with significant medical bills not providing needed financial security. The premium increases over the last years have strained individuals and families. Small businesses struggle to afford health coverage for their workers. And according to national studies, small businesses are charged approximately 18% higher premiums than large companies. Here, just like all around the nation, double-digit premium increases have become a norm, with businesses reporting have to, having to make very difficult decisions to raise deductibles and other out-of-pocket expenses for their workers in order to keep premiums down. The Affordable Care Act creates a significant opportunity to ensure that nearly all district residents have health coverage, to make coverage more affordable, and to ensure that coverage actually works for people who need it, and to provide families with financial security. Through marketplace exchanges, the ACA creates an opportunity for small businesses to have the type of purchasing power that large businesses enjoy today by combining the purchasing power of individuals, families, and small businesses, the district marketplace exchange will create the kind of private market competition needed to drive down costs and improve quality. Through the district's marketplace exchange, qualifying small businesses as well as individuals and families will have access to tax credits paid by the federal government to help reduce the cost of premiums. 
the Exchange's web portal will help create a truly competitive private marketplace that provides new choices of health insurance companies and health insurance policies, choices that do not exist in the current insurance market. The district's marketplace exchange will improve coverage, increase choices, and make coverage affordable for people who live in the district and for small businesses, both nonprofit and for profit companies. And as you know, the district is one of only 18 jurisdictions in the country that is tackling the job of building a private marketplace exchange tailored to the needs and the values of our residents. Rather than having the federal government come in and establish a one-size-fits-all ex exchange, the district once again has stepped forward to lead. And as you know, shortly after President Obama signed the health care law in March of 2010, the district began preparing for implementation through the 2011 legislation signed into law in January of 2012 and the appointment of, of the board, of the executive board for the exchange in the summer of 2012. And of course, in December of 2012, the district was conditionally approved to have a state-based exchange by the federal government. We were one of the first jurisdictions to gain that approval. Importantly, to date, the district has received $82 million in federal funding to help us establish our exchange. And last month, we applied for an additional $18.2 million in supplemental funding to the federal government. We are committed to using federal funds prudently and effectively to create a marketplace exchange that truly serves the needs of the residents and business owners here in the district. Since receiving conditional approval, the Exchange Authority has been focusing our efforts on the following priority areas. One, building the information technology system needed to support the web-based portal that will serve as the district marketplace exchange. This includes online eligibility, enrollment, and plan selection. Number two, building a team of professionals to ensure full implementation and to enable ongoing operations of the marketplace exchange. And, uh, and our third focus area has been ensuring that the district's marketplace exchange reflects the priorities and values of our community. And this means making decisions that are recommended and developed by community-based policy working groups representing diverse voices and interests. As a way of background, currently the DC Department of Healthcare Finance, as the original grantee, acts as our fiduciary for the exchange grant funding while the Exchange Authority builds the necessary infrastructure to have the grant transferred to the Exchange. In fiscal year 2013, the Exchange funding is spent through DHCF under the direction of the Exchange staff. I want to turn to the specifics in building the proposed Exchange Authority budget. The fiscal year 2014 budget for the Exchange Authority is approximately $26.14 million. This supports four main categories of spending, personnel, contracts, in-person assister grants, and operations. Our personnel costs for Exchange staff, including salaries and fringe benefits, are less than $5 million. That's less than 20% of the proposed budget. Contract is the largest portion at approximately $12 million. This will fund several contracts, including agreements with sister agencies performing exchange functions, as well as marketing and IT vendor support. So for example, a key principle in building the exchange is creating an efficient organization leveraging existing district resources and infrastructure to keep, of, to keep the costs of the exchange and the revenue needs low. To this end, the exchange will enter into agreements with 
many sister district agencies to perform key exchange functions, including plan management, el eligibility determinations, and appeals. And so our 2014 proposed budget includes funding for DSB, for DHS, and for Office of Administrative Hearings to perform federally required functions on behalf of the exchange. This approach alleviates the need to build new operations and in some cases helps us avoid duplicating already existing core governmental functions performed very well by sister agencies. The contract's funding will also support short-term needs for expert consulting help and staff support. While some state exchanges have chosen to hire staff for the first several years and then downsize as operational needs change, we decided to use additional consulting support up front. We're building a small permanent team that will need, to, that will need initially and an ongoing basis. Our approach is similar to some of the other state exchanges, focusing on temporary consultant assistance up front without hiring permanent staff to perform the short-term uh, functions that are needed. Our call center is also part of the contract line budget and we included $2.8 million in contracts to operate the exchange call center. The call center is a critically important part of our consumer services, answering questions and guiding people to available services. It will operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week during open enrollment to ensure that assistance is available at all times especially for working residents who may need to enroll during non-business hours. The RFP for the call center was posted on our, web, on our webpage last week and we encourage all vendors to apply. Note that one requirement in the RFP is that the call center is located in designated district space and that district residents are given preference as staff hires for the call center. In addition, our, our marketing budget is part of the contracts line. Beginning this summer, we will work with a broad coalition of community-based partners to provide district residents with information about the new benefits, rights, and responsibilities under the law. Marketing and communications efforts will include television and radio ads, online information, and materials that can be distributed broadly. We plan to work in partnership with business associations, consumer and patient advocates, providers, faith-based organizations, and government agencies. Our goal is to reach people where they live, where they work, where they shop, and where they play. We have included almost $1 million in the proposed budget for these contract activities. Our fourth major budget category is for in-person assister grants. So our fiscal year 2014 budget includes over $5 million for in-person assister grants that will be awarded to nonprofit organizations and other groups to conduct education and enrollment activities for the exchange. Assisters will provide one-on-one -on -one help to consumers community organizations and other groups in the district who know and work with district residents and businesses now will help us to be successful through targeted education, outreach, and enrollment assistance directly to individuals and small businesses. Our fourth category is our operational costs. That includes approximately $1 million in the proposed budget which covers rent, supplies, equipment, and other office support services. I should note that all exchange implementation and operational costs through the calendar year 2014 are funded by federal grants. In terms of our future, beginning January 2015, the DC Health Benefit Exchange is required by federal law to be financially sustainable 
without federal grant funding. We have initiated a policy work group of diverse stakeholders to advise the authority on sustainability and sources of revenue to support our operations. They, they are considering diverse revenue sources, including those similar to what other states will be using, like industry assessments, fees, and other options. In, conclu in conclusion, Madam Chair, we appreciate the opportunity to present testimony on our fiscal year 2014 budget request for the Health Benefit Exchange Authority. As you can see, we're moving ahead quickly to successfully implement the district's exchange. With your continued support, we will ensure the creation of a health insurance marketplace that meets the needs of our population and will continue to place the district at the forefront of our nation in ensuring quality, affordable health coverage for our residents. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, and for the record, could you please state your name and title? I'm Darren Schaefer. I'm the Agency Fiscal Officer for the Department of Healthcare Finance, and my group has been providing, as the Executive Director mentioned, the fiscal support for the exchange. Thank you. So just to give a budget snapshot, uh, the total budget request for FY14, $26,140,499. And that, as you stated, would be special purpose revenue out of the Department of health care finance through grant um, funded through the federal government. Uh, and the total proposed contracts is 15 in total. Total FTEs 37 and still have 23 vacancies currently. So we have a lot of hiring to do. Uh, and with regards to the full-time employees, uh, what did you use to come up with the salaries? Um, for the individual positions. Thank you for your question, and we are recruiting heavily. Um, we'll be making announcements on some of our new hires starting uh, May 7th, uh, later this week. We'll do a press release, um, so I'll make sure that you have a copy of that, Madam Chair. Um, as you know, uh, we are in competition for the best possible experts. We are competing with the federal government. We're competing with sister states. We're competing with the private sector. And so in, uh, in, 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 in successfully competing for the most qualified experts who know the Affordable Care Act, who can hit the ground running, who we don't have to spend two years training. As you know, we don't have two years to train someone. Um, we've had to try to be as competitive as possible. So uh, currently, we are using uh, the district's uh, pay scale. We've made some uh, uh, adjustments to that to enable us to recruit uh, senior level experts uh, who can come in and start uh, effectively working on implementation on day one. Uh, so it has been quite a struggle uh, to recruit uh, expert personnel, especially because um, our, our scale is, um, is somewhat uh, more limited than the federal government scale. And I'll give you an example. Attorneys who work in the federal government are at a higher scale than, um, than uh, our current one. So we uh, worked uh, uh, pretty closely with city officials uh, to enable us to, uh, to recruit qualified people, and I appreciate their assistance very much. Uh, 21 of the 37 positions are over 100,000. Out of those positions, are they specialized, are they technical, or are they required by the Affordable Care Act um, out of those positions? Yes, most, most of our um, staffing is essentially what I would characterize as being top heavy. And what that means is uh, we are uh, recruiting people with expertise in the Affordable Care Act. And um, there are very few people in the nation who have the type of expertise that we need. To know the Affordable Care Act, you have to know something about Medicaid. You have to know a whole lot about private health insurance and industry and products. 
you have to know the Internal Revenue Code and ERISA and the Public Health Service Act. So um, it does require a very um, uh, high level uh, expertise and knowledge. And to enable us to recruit people with that skill set, uh, we've had to have salaries set up uh, uh, in a way to, to attract uh, qualified people. Uh, for after this fiscal year, will these positions still hold, or are you going to eliminate any positions? Uh, no. Uh, our vision is to uh, create a very lean uh, quasi-government agency. And so we're not recruiting more staff than we will need over the long term. Initially, our staff, staffing needs are great, and we are relying on consultants to help us with the initial push. Uh, we, we're not creating uh, uh, an agency that has hundreds of people only to essentially downsize later. And um, so our focus really is a very core group of people who can do the work now and immediately, who can do the work as our functions continue to grow and to change, uh, and really relying on expert outside consultants to help us uh, when we need the additional help. Madam uh, Chair, you, oh. Madam Chair, also the chair of our operations committee and the board, Diane Lewis, is here, who's been intimately involved in this process. If, with your permission, I request her to come, and she may be oh. able to add something to this discussion. Certainly. Thank you very kindly. Because I was going to ask, what are we doing to actively recruit uh, for these 23 vacancies? Uh, so uh, we are uh, actively recruiting. We're uh, working very closely with our federal partners uh, who also provide uh, support and resources uh, to other states. And so uh, we get uh, they are a, a very good uh, resource for us because they've been working with folks in other states um, and uh, vendors who uh, sometimes express an interest in, in, uh, in not doing consulting work but becoming uh, 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 permanent staff and state-based exchanges. So they're a very good source of information. When, uh, when Dr. Actor and I do uh, uh, community group outreach and speak to a variety of audiences, every opportunity I get, I recruit. In fact, I'll share with you one of my first uh, public events in my job was my uh, two days after I came on board, and I think I, I gave a presentation to Care First, and I did recruit uh, when I was doing my presentation, which I'm sure they did not appreciate. But every chance I get, I am spreading the word that we're looking for qualified people. We've been teaming up with uh, Director Stokes um, of HR, and her team has been very helpful to us in also publicizing uh, the positions that we have. We're being very creative in all of our recruitment efforts. I believe there's some good news for the agency fiscal officer. Uh, what is the status of that hiring? <clears throat> Um, Mr. Keith Fletcher has been uh, basically assigned to the Health Benefits Exchange Authority, so he will be taking over as a, a dedicated agency fiscal officer. He's here in the audience. Congratulations. Thank you. So I'll still see him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, contracts. I want to go on to contracts. How do you come up with the dollar amount for each contract? Uh, so, as you know, our planning for this budget uh, occur occurred quite a while ago. We had uh, the benefit of looking at what other state-based exchanges were planning for and uh, what other states were doing. And uh, we uh, relied on that source of information to help us figure out our own needs 
uh, for uh, contracts. Uh, we also worked very closely with sister agencies uh, to assess how much additional funding support they would need from us uh, in order to perform some of the functions that they'll be performing on our behalf. So it was a combination of uh, doing a good assessment with sister agencies on their uh, uh, funding uh, requirements as well as learning lessons from other state-based exchanges in, in um, how much others were planning for and were actually using. Uh, people are mentioning, and I know federal dollars are concerned, but the I guess there's a big push as far as the D.C. Council is concerned for um, CBEs um, when these contracts are awarded. Uh, what is your policy um, for including small and local businesses uh, with regards to these contracts? We very much encourage uh, uh, vendors to utilize uh, local expertise and local resources on the ground. I can tell you in terms of our sister grants and the $10 million we envision providing to local nonprofits, faith-based organizations, business groups and others. Uh, the whole focus will be on local groups who have been on the ground, who know the communities, who know uh, block by block the neighbors to help us uh, with uh, education and enrollment. In terms of our other contracts, uh, our other contracts um, I can uh, tell you about the RFP for the call center. Uh, we have very specific requirements in, in the request for proposals to build our call center that the winning vendor agrees to hire D.C. residents to staff the call center. And uh, there are very uh, strict requirements also to use the facility that we've identified in the district to actually house uh, the, uh, the main call center. Uh, so we have, we're very much committed to, uh, to making sure that as we continue building the exchange here, that we use the local expertise, the local resources, and people who live in the district to help us accomplish that. Uh, so we're where, where will the call center be located? And do you have an idea on the number of staff that will be at the call center? I'd like to have one of my um, deputies provide that information to you. Sure. Playing a bit of musical chairs here. Yeah. Good morning, morning Ready Chair. Uh, the call center will be located at 2100 Martin Luther King Avenue, and currently that facility can accommodate approximately 50 people on site. Uh, the vendor will be required to have an alternative backup location in case of disaster, or so there is uh, additional room for growth there. But that is the basic. Uh, staffing requirement for that facility. And when will the RFPs go out? The RFP for the call center was posted last week on our website and we're also uh, working with Director Staten's office to, uh, to utilize their um, uh, opportunities to notify d uh, various vendors that the RFP is, is in fact posted. So all the contracts will go through the Office of Contracts and Procurement? Uh, uh, no, we're partnering with Director Staten to help us advertise uh, the request for proposals uh, that we're also posting on our web page. And all of them will go out around the same time, or when are we expecting them to go out? Are they going to be going out all at different times? Uh, that's correct. Our next major one um, is is likely to be uh, to obtain uh, law firm uh, 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 assistance with uh, with uh, legal work, uh, and so that RFP will likely go out in the next couple of weeks. After that, the the large RFP will focus on uh, obtaining assistance with marketing and advertisement and helping us to uh, to develop and launch a marketing campaign. So that will be the next RFP, and um, and the goal is to uh, to uh, have that out uh, probably in the next month or six weeks. At the same time, as soon as we're notified by the federal government with respect to our 18.2 uh, million uh, supplemental request for additional grants, 
will be able to uh, uh, to issue RFP uh, for assistance in in helping us with uh, our uh, in-person assister program. A as you know, we intend to provide ten million dollars in grant funding to uh, to groups here in the district to help us with enrollment and education. Now you have listed. One hundred and fifty-three thousand uh, dollars each for the navigator grants and broker services contracts, and that seems considerably low to me. So maybe if you could explain the function uh, for those uh, grant recipients. Um, yes. So the one hundred fifty-three thousand six hundred that you're looking at for broker services. That's really uh, consulting support that we need uh, from an outside expert to uh, to to help us with anything related to uh, to broker activities. Uh, in terms of uh, contracts for vendors to help us put together training materials and a certification program for. Uh, for groups uh, who uh, want to become assisters, uh, we have uh, we're allocating funding uh, uh, to have a vendor help help us with that. We also uh, will be using a vendor to help figure out uh, how to uh, uh, provide the grant funding, uh, develop criteria for for groups uh, to apply for the sister grant funding. So essentially, we can't do those things in-house. We just don't have permanent enough staff to focus on that. So we'll be using outside consultants and vendors to help us do that. Will the services differ, or how will they differ from um, the contracts under Navigator and the sister subgrants? Uh, so um, the sister, the navigator and assister grants program. That's uh, that's to help us uh, put together uh, uh, a request for proposals uh, and other things that we need to do uh, that we don't have internal staff to do. So we'll be using outside consultants to help us put together RFPs and help with the planning for that. And do you have specific contracts that are required by the ACA? Uh, so, pretty much um, most of the uh, things that we are doing are ACA requirements, either direct or indirect. Uh, so, for instance, we have a, a contract line for annual audits. Those are financial audits, um, and we'll need to do that as part of our compliance with uh, uh, the grants that we've received uh, under the ACA. Um, we have a budget uh, contract uh, aligned for financial transactions. Um, essentially, uh, that's currently at uh, $3.8 million, and that uh, uh, we intend to use for general purposes also to help us meet some of the requirements. Um, well, what, what's going to happen overall in terms of spending if you come under budget pressures? Are you going to be um, depending on local dollars? Can the federal government um, assist with more funding? What will happen in that case? And I know you made accurate projections, I guess. Is that how you came up um, with the amount that the federal government is going to assist with? Uh, and what happens if you go over budget? So the federal government is our full partner, and the federal government has promised all the state-based exchanges to be full partners and help uh, provide us with the resources we need to ensure that we uh, are successful in building our exchange and and moving us forward. Um, and so we've applied for 18.2 million in supplemental funding. Uh, we're waiting to hear from the federal government uh, uh, whether that will be approved. Uh, and we should get information from them in the next couple of weeks. I'll be able to uh, report back to you on that. We also intend to apply for additional grant funding, and mostly the additional uh, needs around uh, some of the IT uh, uh, build that we need to do. So we know already that we'll need additional help 
uh, and support from the federal government and our federal partners. I'm very optimistic that our federal partners will be there to help us with the resources that we need. There are no city dollars involved in the fiscal year 2014 proposal, and we will not be seeking city dollars to support our operations or our efforts uh, in fiscal year 2014. Uh, for 2015 when we have to be, uh, calendar year 2015 when we have to be self-sustaining, we are focusing on other revenue sources and are not focusing on any kind of city subsidization for our program. That's good news. <laughs> uh, but what are the amounts of additional grants um, that you will obtain? Do you have that amount uh, and the dates that you may receive them? Uh, so we've applied for the 18.2 million uh, last month, and we'll know in the next couple of weeks whether that will be approved. And in uh, in terms of uh, the next grant opportunity, the next one is in May, and the following one with the federal government, I, I believe, is in July. Uh, so we're in the process of assessing exactly how much additional funding we may need. Uh, for unanticipated uh, costs and most of the unanticipated costs which are a little bit hard to predict is around IT uh, so we want to make sure that we ask the federal government for enough funding and if we so, so for the dates I'm sorry in May and July the turnaround is about two weeks that you will know whether you receive it or not uh, no, the federal government doesn't <laughs> act that fast. <laughs> um, I was like, wow, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I apologize um, for not being clear. So we've uh, already applied for additional supplemental funding, uh, $18.2 million. We submitted that application, that grant request, to the federal government last month. Okay. We anticipate hearing from them in the next week or two. Uh, about uh, that uh, additional request. Future requests, uh, the next grant opportunity with the federal government is in May. And then after that, there's another grant opportunity in July. We have not yet determined how, uh, how much an additional funding will be requesting. Uh, so we're, we're still looking at that and uh, we'll make a determination and are likely to apply for additional funding. But you definitely know one of the programs to be allocated will be the IT. That, is there any other program that stands out right now? Uh, yes. Um, so marketing, we we absolutely need um, a, a very good marketing budget. And as you know, uh, the district market, uh, media market, tends to be more expensive than many other markets. Uh, so that's an area where we want to make sure we have adequate funding. Um, and I'm firmly committed to empowering our partners on the ground uh, to help educate and get people enrolled. So we need to make sure that uh, the assist or in-person assister program is, is well funded. Uh, so those are the three major areas. So for the intra-district funds that you have listed here, um, one for IT support, Auto 37,000. Uh, and I see one for fixed cost telephones, Octo as well, 23380, 23,000. Is there a way now when we have all of this money towards the IT contract, what type of support is Octo going to give in addition to the IT contractor? I'm just curious yeah. to know, you know, the IT contractor yeah. cannot do it alone? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> Madam yes. Chair, that's a very important question. The issue here is not only building the exchange by itself, by the IT contractor, but its ability to be able to, to communicate with all agencies of the government. We are doing much bigger job here than other states where federal government is implementing the exchange because we are also upgrading our other human services um, uh, programs, so they all be uh, computerized, they all be online, they all be integrated. And so it is the communication with the others that we need Octo's support 
their participation, their oversight, so we make sure that we build the exchange in a way that is able to communicate with all other agencies of the government. And you did mention a partnership with human resources and your hiring right. capabilities. What about Department of Employment Services? Um, are they going to be a partner? I don't see them listed on here. And I know a lot of people go to Department of Employment Services when they're seeking employment. So are you going to partner with them as well? Uh, yes, so we're committed to essentially paying for services that city agencies are providing to us. And so uh, we have uh, an MOU with certain um, city agencies already. We're in the process of finalizing other MOUs uh, where we uh, pay for the services the city agencies provide us. In terms of partnering with um, uh, Employment services. Employment services. Uh, we very much would like to do that to help us uh, with our own uh, hiring needs, uh, with uh, providing support uh, to the call center with their hiring uh, uh, needs, as well as educating people about the Affordable Care Act and the opportunity to enroll in the exchange. So the education uh, focus and outreach, uh, that's where uh, uh, many of our discussions will, will focus on. Well, would there be an amount that you need to allocate to Department of Employment Services? I just want to make sure um, with this budget that we, we did not plan on, uh, on a specific amount being allocated to employment services. That would be, I mean, would, could that be considered? Uh, human resources, I know the Department of Human Resources, that's once a person gets hired and they would process, you know, whatever they help with, they assist with the actual applicant who has been, you know, hired. But in the meantime, if you have 23 vacancies, maybe Department of Employment Services could assist you um, with obtaining those qualified um, persons. That would be the direct, play, one of the, you know, one of the first lines of, of defense an unemployed person goes to is someone who's seeking other employment. Madam Chair, we, we do need the, the help from the employment services, not only in terms of recruitment, but the most fundamental part is that many of the people who come to the employment services need also health insurance. <laughs> so we want those people to be recruited into the exchange so they could get the health insurance, they could get the subsidy that may be coming to them so they could buy the insurance. And so there will be partnership with every single agency of the city government. Uh, we have made the presentation to the mayor's cabinet on this, on this issue because everybody can play a role in reaching out to the folks who need coverage so that they, we can bring everybody in. So it's a motor vehicle where people come, where they gather, employment services where people come, human resource centers where people come, so, and, and recreational centers where people come. So everywhere would be the effort, and we will ultimately have the resources available to make sure that they can do the job. Well, thus far, how have you advertised these vacancies? Our, our direct hires, uh, we, uh, uh, Director uh, Sean Stokes of HR, her team has been helping us. Uh, she's provided uh, uh, some of her uh, staff people to be dedicated to, uh, to helping us uh, develop job descriptions and classify the positions and, and get them posted on DCHR website. We also post the positions on our website, but uh, the, the primary way I believe that people find out about uh, the jobs are through DCHR. And just could you give for the record your website address? <laughs> www.dcxbx.com www.dchbx.com for the listening uh, public www.dchbx.com we have 23 jobs waiting for you out there <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in comparison, um, FY13 to FY14, 
Um, I've observed that you've decreased the information technology funding, that's program 1040, by 61 percent. Um, but you're still planning to spend approximately 350000 What will you be spending this on? I think in 2013, we are building up the exchange. Once the exchange is built, then it's the maintenance and, and, and support of the exchange activity that will be carried out in 2014. Um, if I may add, um, the, the 2013 budget was built using the grant application. So, you know, at the time, uh, folks formulated the grant application and trying to think through how they wanted to use it. Um, and then in, uh, for 14, obviously, it was formulated later with more information. Um, because the, the 13 number has a lot of uh, payroll costs in it. And I believe much of that was shifted to being um, it's a contractors, which is why you see the difference. Uh, why is there no increase in the budget for your plan management programs and eligibility and enrollment programs in FY14? There was a decrease from 1.9 million to 20, approximately 243,000. And the plan management decreased from 200 and 55,000 to 243,000. Many and of our federal funding as well. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, so many of our uh, financial needs this year are are, to, are the startup costs, the the building or enhancing existing systems. Ongoing costs uh, are uh, are less. So the investment is up front and that's why you see some of the differences in our in our budget. And as you mentioned, a major increase is in consumer education. And that increased over one hundred percent. So what will be the difference between what you've done in FY thirteen and FY fourteen? I guess a lot. Yeah, yes. <laughs> uh, but what's gonna take place in FY fourteen? 13, we were building the policies, we were building the exchange. When it gets done, then it will be the outreach to the consumers to make sure that everybody gets to who is eligible get to be enrolled. We take the maximum advantage of the federal subsidies that are available, both for the individuals and for the small businesses. So there will be a major emphasis on outreach. And then we're going to make sure that we have special outreach for some specialty groups, for example, gay, lesbian, and, and bisexual individuals, for example, hard to reach businesses, for example, special emphasis on construction and, uh, and restaurant industry where people don't have health insurance. So that's why the, 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 the expenses will be more in 2014 because we want to make sure we bring in everybody and take advantage of this opportunity where federal subsidies are available to, uh, for us to support the insurance program. And lastly, <laughs> when do you believe you will meet the conditions of the federal granting entities uh, that require for you to receive the grant funds directly? Uh, well, it was an important first step when Dr. Gandhi's office detailed Keith Fletcher uh, to us yesterday. Uh, so it, it's terrific to have him um, on detail to us full time. That is one of the most important first steps that we needed to take. There are additional requirements that we need to have in place. Uh, we need to develop certain processes and procedures, certain uh, financial controls. Uh, I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to uh, to uh, focus on uh, on completing those uh, in the next uh, uh, month to six weeks uh, to enable us to receive federal grants directly. Ultimately, it will be up to the federal government to take a look at what we've done and uh, let us know whether we meet the basic requirements or work with us in the areas where they feel, um, hypothetically, of course, um, if we don't meet a requirement. But I envision that 
now being on the fast track uh, as a result of having Keith Fletcher on board full time. Well, yes, ma'am. I just wanted to uh, just say kind of in. It, and I'm sorry, could you state your um, name and title for the record? Too? Absolutely. My name is Diane Lewis, and I'm on the executive board of the DC Health Benefit Exchange. Um, and just wanted to say, Madam Chair, that um, as a board member and uh, part of the exchange, um, we are committed to the exchange being accountable in the District of Col Columbia and committed um, to the issues and concerns that affect health care in the city, um, that we reflect its diversity and that our actions and activities are transparent and available to all. Um, so we are very much committed to ensuring that health care uh, and that we make up the 7 percent of those who still do not have insurance will have insurance um, when we stand up. Thank you. Thank you all um, for your testimony this morning. It's been a pleasure to work with you, and I look forward to our continued um, working together to get this up and running by October 1, yes. so we can be ready to roll out in January 2014. Absolutely. Uh, and this concludes today's budget oversight hearing for the Health Benefit Exchange Authority. I would like to thank you all once again. And the record will be open for one week. Uh, and we'll close on Tuesday, April 30th at 5.30 p.m. The time is 11.43 a.m. and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.